Oh, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Today, we are going to be discussing how to get into an Ivy League college in 2024. Woohoo. <laughs> but before we do that, I wanted to answer some of the questions from last week. So there were two really popular questions. One was about, oh, I need to enable screen share. One was about transfers, and another was about conclusions for some of these applications. Transfers and conclusions. I'm going to prepare a little whiteboard over here using Canva. But actually, let me just wait for people to trickle in. Oh, hello, Rahela Asani. So nice for you to join. Wow, we have three viewers. So exciting. Okay, but just like I was saying, I wanted to answer some of the questions that you guys had from last week. Um, yeah, and please feel free to message me in the chat, engage, interact. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just finished eating lunch. In fact, I'm still eating some lunch, so I might pause every once in a while and just take a bite. <laughs> it's been a really busy day. Okay, the questions that people were really interested in was, let's see, sh share screen. Okay, cool. Oh, wow. All right. The two questions that people were really interested in was transfers and then um, conclusions. So let's talk briefly about that. And then again, if you guys have questions in the chat, we will discuss that. These are the questions from last week, just for clarification. And then um, I will also talk a little bit about some strategies for getting into top colleges this year, in case there's like interested juniors. Always nice to start early. How to get in. Okay, so when it comes to transfers, um, let's say you guys have just applied to college and or you are a first year at said college and you're not super excited about where you ended up, it's not a good fit, so you're interested in transferring. Well, you're gonna need a few key ingredients. Um, you need, of course, pretty much a stellar GPA. You'll need um, recommendations as well from, wait, there must be an easier way for me to do this. I apologize, guys. Um, let me see, everyone can hear me well? I think, yeah, let, let me see if I can do it like this. Hmm. Sorry, guys, I'm using this new software, so it's kind of hard. Um, okay, cool. Yes, I figured it out. All right, so for transfer applications, um, what you really need are some pretty awesome recommendations. Like, I feel like... Um, GPA is a given. But let's break this down. GPA, recommendations, and internship, research, honors, awards. A lot of these are going to be pretty similar to getting into a great Ivy League school as well, now that I think about it. Maybe I'll move this down over here. Well, maybe we can talk about conclusions another time. But yeah, a lot of students don't really think about transferring. It's super underrated. And I have so many successful transfer stories from many of the students that I've worked with. Also, you just end up saving so much money. Some of my friends, they went to a public school. They went to a community college for one to two years. Boom, transferred, got into Yale, got into Georgetown. Excuse me. And when you graduate, the piece of paper is all the same. You get the Georgetown diploma or the Yale diploma. Granted, I think a lot of students just self, what is it called? Self-select and they kind of self-cancel or self uh, deny, what is that called? <laughs> they self-reject, excuse me. They self-reject because they see the transfer application rates are so low, right? They end up being maybe less than um, less than 5% for some of these schools. But I think it's because people are just not transferring properly. Um, so anyways, the GPA is a given. You basically need a perfect GPA if you want to transfer. Now, the good news is that they're not really going to factor in your GPA from high school. So let's say your GPA from high school was pretty poor. But now you want to transfer and you have an amazing GPA from your first year at um, some college, uh, then you're good to go. So that's kind of what happened to my friend. It was really funny. I worked hard for four years in high school. He worked hard for one year at his other at the college that he was accepted into. And then he just transferred, balled out. So it was in a way, he kind of like worked 25% as hard as I did and got the same outcome, if not better. So it's kind of funny when you think about it that way. Um, Oh, yes, gap year. We're going to talk about that as well. The gap year is an absolute cheat code that a lot of students should be thinking about, both in college and in high school. Now, recommendations. How do you get recommendations? You can't just start asking people um, a month or two before the deadline, right, guys? Like, you need to start buttering them up. 
and really establishing a relationship with these professors from the get-go. Ideally, you enter college and you're meeting with your professor every month, maybe once or twice a month, maybe even more frequently. And maybe you can combine this with some of the other opportunities. You do research with them, for them. Um, then you submit your research and it gets published. Boom, that's how you win an honor and get an award, right? Or maybe you are competing in a club, like this is what my friend did. He was interested in robotics. So then he launched a robotics competition club. He competed. He got the professor to be his advisor. And it was basically just, all he did was just eat lunch with the professor once or twice a month, update him on all the cool robots that he was building and um, just fill him in, keep him in the loop. You'd be surprised, but these professors are pretty lonely people. I Another really, really small hack, but really powerful, effective, is to find professors who are new. I mean, these guys are just like you. They just got to the college. They don't really know anyone. They want to establish relationships with students. So that's what I did. I found a professor who had just transferred from Duke. He had taught at Duke for like 12 years, a religion professor. And then he started teaching religion at Yale. And he was a Buddhist monk. We hit it off. And so I would just keep talking to him. And when I needed to apply for master's programs, he was the one who wrote my recommendations. All right. So you need recommendations in high school and you also need recommendations in college, no matter what, right? Like you're going to graduate from college. Maybe you apply for some job, you apply for some master's degree, you apply for some uh, PhD, you are going to need recommendations. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, oh, and by the way, yeah, feel free to keep writing comments. Um, I'm going to look at the other screen. For now, I'm just going to teach using this little Canva whiteboard, but I really want you guys to ask questions, engage. That's kind of why I'm here. Otherwise, I would just make a pre-recorded video. Okay. Um, internships and research honors and awards. Uh, we will just kind of leave that here for now. It is a very extensive talk, um, but... When it comes to internships, it's a lot like maybe some of you guys are familiar with applying to summer programs or fellowships. So you basically just create a giant spreadsheet. And yeah, let's talk a little bit about the gap year. What is so cheat code in a gap year? In a gap year, you can do all this times like three or four, right? So in a gap year, I've heard of students design like a really amazing gap year. And what does it look like? Let's see. The gap year, you can do it between in high school. You can do it between your senior year of high school, first year of college. You can even do it between, I mean, it's pretty rare for people to do it between like junior and senior year of high school, um, but it, it can be done. Let's see. This is the transfer stuff. This is the gap year stuff. Um, but you can also do it between your first year and second year of college. This is super duper genius. It's, I'll, I'll explain why in just a moment. So a lot of students, they're competing for the same internships in the summer, whether that's finance internships, whether that's like summer research opportunities with hotshot professors. But if you do a gap year, then you can apply and work for really, really cool companies when no one else is applying, right? Like, think about that. Think of some of the biggest firms in the world, right? If you're interested in working at Goldman Sachs or if you're interested in working at NASA, like everyone's going to have a summer internship program. But if you hit them up in the winter or in the fall or in the spring when everyone else is in school and there's no competition, you just show up and you keep showing up then you can get an internship that no one else can do. And plus, you're the only intern there. So they're going to pay way more attention to you. So when it comes to the gap year, you should think about um, splitting it up into seasons. So you'll have, of course, fall, winter, spring, and summer. And basically, each season, I would dedicate to something pretty pretty serious. You know, So maybe when some, some people do, they do three months of a job, job or internship. The job can be a menial job. Like you work as a lifeguard. You work you know, as a waiter. You do something cool. Maybe you, you go to... Um, a specific restaurant, you learn how to cook. Um, so that, or you can do something much more professional, right? And you're going to be like, oh, I want to learn how to how to trade crypto or <laughs> quant stuff. Um, and then you can somehow uh, figure out a way to get an internship at one of those firms, boutiques. Uh, of course, that's great. Another three months can be just spent, you know, rabbit hole, tunnel vision, cave in your bedroom, self-studying, which is honestly really, really good too. I've had students who literally just went through the entire MIT curriculum and again, there's another Yale channel called Yale Courses, guys, where you can literally get these, um, you can literally get a, a degree basically from Yale for free just by these videos. Like it has a million subscribers. There's Yale Courses, there's MIT Open Courseware, there's the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Sit down, go through all these lectures, right? And then guess what? When you apply to transfer to MIT, Yale, Stanford, and you're like, I basically watched hundreds of hours of lectures. I mean, that's a pretty compelling case, don't you think? So that's actually how a lot of our international students got into really amazing colleges. Okay, another three months can be spent um, doing some sort of, you can also 
I would still say like some sort of service project or initiative would be really good. Building your own nonprofit, building your own company. It doesn't have to be that serious. So, I mean, you could just create an app, a game. Um, you could just spend three months really diving into some form of art um, and just maybe self-publishing a short book. There's so many different things that you could do. Um, you could even try doing some of this stuff at the same time. So you're self-studying MIT CS, and then you build a little CS tool. And then finally, the last three months, I would highly recommend traveling if possible. Um, this is just going to put you in a lot of really unique circumstances and give you much more cannon fodder, great material to write about in your college applications. So this is an amazing strategy for pretty much everyone watching this video, whether you are a junior who's about to enter college applications, whether you're a senior who's just finished. Um, I think that one of the best things you can do in college is take a gap year between your first and second year, because think about what the purpose of college is, right? It's basically to get a job, job security, economic prospects. And if you are able to do all this and, you know, a lot of freshmen and sophomores, they complain because they're like, oh, I don't have any experience. You can spend an entire year with the purpose of gaining this professional experience, developing your skills, because newsflash Employers, they really don't care at all what you did in college. Very, very little. They don't really care about your GPA. They don't really care about what clubs you did. What they care about is your previous work experience and professional experience. That's like number, number one. And then they're going to force you to do some sort of project and they'll see how you perform. So if you've already finished the college application wave, then your next step is thinking about, I guess, a job, money, um, or maybe something else. Maybe you guys are interested in research. Maybe you guys are interested in getting um, a PhD and pursuing grad school, of course, totally valid too. In that case, your plan will change. It, it might just be more educational focused, research focused, et cetera. Or again, maybe you can just do a, um, some people do a year abroad or a semester abroad and take like a kind of gap year and go to a different country. Okay, so other questions from the team. Rohan says, I got deferred from Yale and was wondering how you should interpret a Yale deferral. What should I expect for RD? Okay, let's answer some questions. If you, I, I made a video about getting deferred from Yale, um, so you can just check that out. And I won't get into it now, but there's literally a link to the deferral letter that I wrote as well in the description. So you can pull that up here. Maybe I'll send it in the chat and you can see what you should be doing. Um, I think this is the case for Yale, but some schools are very different. Stanford has a form that they want you to fill out. Um, some schools don't even want an update. So it really depends on the particular school and it depends on your case and just give them what they ask for. Um, if you don't, that could sort of annoy them. But yeah, check out this video as well. I'll break down my deferral letter. It wasn't really the best deferral letter in the world. So I would also do your research and take a look at a few different ones. Suleiman, two gap years for an international student. Um, two gap years might look a little bit suspicious, to be honest. Um, but worst comes to worst, I would still, it's still an option. Um, and if you have a really good reason for your first gap year, someone was sick, there was a particular reason, your school got shut down, COVID, then it's more understandable. I mean, some students, like their school was shut down because there was no electricity because of a monsoon. It makes sense. You took a gap year. Anyak. Mayank, excuse me. <laughs> I'm an in Hi, Kevin. I'm an international student, and I'm thinking about writing about an educational trip I went on with my professor with my mom, who's a professor, which was meant for her students. Is it a good idea? Yeah, that could totally work. But just make sure that we, we you paint yourself as a protagonist. So it's not just going to be like, oh, I was following along. I was listening to what my mom was teaching, but really saying like I was aiding her with the teaching, with the educational material. Uh, really paint yourself as the protagonist, the main character. You are the driver, the engine, the compass. I just be wary of... of um, of writing about stories with other people. It can be dangerous where suddenly the essay or the personal statement or the story is more about this other person as opposed to yourself. In fact, Jeff and I both made this very same mistake. It is not something that will instantly get you rejected, but it could kind of hurt your chances. And ultimately, a lot of admission officers will complain and be like, yeah, this essay is about Kevin's dad or Jeff's dad. It's not actually about Kevin. So they want to hear more about you, right? Okay, on that note, how do you interpret a Harvard deferral? So Harvard, as Rahela just pointed out, um, is that 80% of applicants got deferred from Harvard. I will say that deferrals from different schools mean different things. Stanford defers very few kids. Stanford defers very few kids. So if you got deferred from Stanford, that's a really good sign. 
again, if you got deferred from Harvard, 80% of people got deferred, then it's not, um, not as impressive. But at the same time, there's things you can do. You definitely want to keep updating them about all the cool things you've done your senior year. It's going to look a little bit suspicious if like you still you you haven't grown your initiative or you haven't been competing in awards competitions. They still want to see you do things like that. Um, yeah, actually, to give you guys a sense, it seems there's a lot of deferral questions. So I'll just pull up my old deferral letter and walk you guys through that. OK, let's zoom in here so people can see what's going on. First off, oh, I was deferred by Princeton. Princeton was like my dream school for the longest time. But in hindsight, I'm really glad that I didn't go to Princeton because from my friends who went there, I've heard it's a very intense research atmosphere. Back then, too, I would say five, 10 years ago, um, well, five years ago, I'm not that old. <laughs> Princeton had exams after the break, which really sucked. So basically, you'd spend your whole break studying. And they had some um, bell curves, which means that a percentage of the class had really you know, even if you got like 80%, maybe your grades still wouldn't be a B. It might even be a little bit worse. But the general gist is I would begin your deferral letter by, with a sandwich. So you begin by restating that Harvard, Stanford, whatever is your number one choice. Then I a short paragraph of why the school is your number one choice. The more personal you can make it, um, and especially if you can say I visited or I've, you know, been keeping in touch with the social media that's been coming out or I've been watching new students who are there or I heard from a friend who, after his first semester, or I watched this interview with a current student, all that will help. Um, this isn't the best why Princeton answer either. I think I definitely could have gotten way more specific. I could have added more proper nouns. I could have referenced um, friends I know who went to Princeton and were saying up wonderful things about it. So that would have been better. Okay, then the, the tone of my deferral letter is definitely more casual. Um, and also some students ask, how long should the deferral letter be? This one is 800 words. It's a borderline a little bit too long. Not less than 500 words, though. So somewhere between like somewhere around 650 is a good sweet spot. All right, next up, um, sharing some academic updates. In senior year, I did something pretty interesting. I started just taking different languages. Uh, our school, uh, my, my high school offered a bunch of different languages, and I just really wanted to work on my Chinese. Um, the real reason is because Chinese, high level Chinese, it's like one of those things, guys, where when you get to like really high level subjects, it's easier, right? Because like the professor is super chill or your teacher is super chill. So that's what was happening in Chinese. There was like four people. I didn't really have to show up. Um, I would just skip class and just chill. So that's why I took Chinese. But at the same time, we, we were engaging in some material and my aunt was in China uh, and I wanted to talk to her a little bit. So I was taking some Chinese. But you can see like, I think that the angle I was going for was something a lot more authentic, more humble and just giving them a better sense of who I am as a person, not necessarily like who I am as an academic intellectual, but more of just like what motivates me as a human being. And they're more interested in that than, you know, your intellect, to be honest, or like your IQ. So anyways, after that, um, I talked a little bit about some of the other courses that I'm interested in. And then one thing that was really cool is I just started a project, um, an art project, a new social initiative. And this, I think, really helped my case a lot. Because it's like, Kevin, has, I, I really had no reason to do this. It wasn't really college oriented at all. Um, but it, it was because of some other summer program. And then it just ended up being something nice that I could write about for my deferral letter. And honestly, I'm looking back at this joke, and I think it's kind of cringe. So um, <laughs> I, I should have had somebody else look at it on my own scale, on the own Elevate Ed like rubric. I, put a, I probably would have rated this around like a 6.57, which is good but by no means like um demands admission i think the real reason i got in is because there was a my college counselor played a huge role i went to a private boarding school and we had quite a relationship with these top schools and i'm pretty sure that my college counselor who was completely new that year her name was miss sherry hernandez um really amazing nice latino woman and she I think really just vouched for me and was like, you need to get Kevin into this school. So your guidance counselor also plays a big role. I think a lot of students don't know that. Your guidance counselor writes a recommendation for you. Um, even international students who are from like India or Asia, you can, what we, what we help students do is maybe your guidance counselor writes something in their language and then we help students translate it, kind of um, smooth it out. And those things do matter. 
um, recommendation letters really can never hurt you. They're like interviews, recommendation letters and interviews can't really hurt you at all. Um, so I would take advantage of those. And a lot of these top schools take recommendation letters incredibly seriously, even more seriously than your essays, perhaps. Okay, now we have a lot more questions. Okay, I want to write about my father. He was in two, two he was in jail for two years. Should I write about that? Is that risky? Again, same thing with the relationship essay point I brought up earlier. It's totally fine to talk about another family member, but just mention what did you gain from this experience and then how have you applied it in your own life? So for instance, if you've seen your father who was jailed um, uh, wrongly and it was an injustice and then you decided to study law and, and foster justice, promote you know, legal education in your community, that's what they're interested in. But like not, you should re really make sure that your father being in jail is not more than 50% of your story. It should be less than 30% if we're being honest, maybe even less than 20 to 25%. How much leeway do deferred applicants have for a mid-year report? How much leeway? I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand this question. Um, yeah, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more, Rohan. Okay, so I have six to seven national awards. Whoa, A pluses in my classes and I'm a leader in many programs. What's the possibility I'll get into MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and other IVs? It really depends on a lot of other factors too, like what, where you're applying from. Are you an international student, a domestic student? Do you go to a public school, a private school? Yeah, there's, this is not enough information to make a judgment call. <laughs> what do you recommend for students who are going to apply for 2024, like a timeline? That's a really good question. That is a really, really good question. I will, hmm. For juniors who are interested in applying now, the best thing that you guys can do in the summer is, again, like some summer program, start thinking about really great honors awards in the spring. There's so many competitions that open up in March and April. So I would take those very seriously and I would take your summer very seriously. Um, and then essays. So those three things, honors and awards, competition, which come from competitions in the spring, as well as internships and research that you can do in the summer, and then growing out some project or initiative, nonprofit. If you have an existing one and you're scaling it, that's amazing. If you don't have an existing one, then I would try to start something small, uh, even now. If you do it like two months before the deadline, it appears very disingenuous, like you're trying to pad your resume. But if you start now and you're like, oh, I'm trying to write a book about um, legal justice, about people being unfairly jailed, et cetera, um, for middle schoolers, high schoolers, then if you start now, it's more legit. If you start projects now, as opposed to September, October, and the deadline is what, November 1st? Okay. Some examples of questions I can ask my interviewer to break the ice and sound cool. I think we have a list of questions to ask interviewers. We also have a video about this as well. How to crush your college interview. Elevate Ted. I'm pretty sure these are already on the channel. Yeah, so I have, um, okay, yeah, this was created a, long, a while ago. But I'll send this in the chat. Um, so just take a look at that. There's a bunch of questions that you should ask as well. I literally have a, a section that says, ask this at the end of your interview. <laughs> My school grading system doesn't quite match the American one. It doesn't report GPA and credit. Oh, really good question. So. When you apply to college, there's going to be a whole other section called the additional information section, and you can write 650 words describing your particular school's curriculum, um, grading system, all that good stuff. So that's where you should elaborate and really explain how that, how that works. Yeah, I definitely would not mention other acceptances in your deferral letter. <laughs> okay, guys, now let's get to the heart of this video. A lot of people are interested in how to get in. There are so many different factors um, when it comes to getting into a top 20, top Ivy League school. Um, some are going to be in our control, and then some are very much not in our control. So like you guys tell me, what is not in your control and what is in your control, in our control? And then I'll create another one that says not in our control. And obviously, we should focus on the one. What's crazy to me is how much students obsess over the ones, over the over the factors that are not in their control, right? That's like obsessing over kind of like the weather or it's just, it, it really, if you're gonna use that energy, that's why we go through this exercise. But if you're gonna use that energy to worry, we might as well start worrying about the things that are actually in our control. Um, what is not in our control would be like gender, 
um, uh, would be things related to race, socioeconomic status, would be things such as geography plays a huge, huge role as well, the type of school you go to. Well, to the extent that maybe there are some really young students watching this, like if you're in ninth or 10th grade, then you can still control some of these aspects. Um, but for the most part, we really can't, especially if you guys are in your last year or two of high school. The things that you guys should be focusing on intensely are your extracurriculars, and this will relate to your honors, awards, summer programs. A lot of students just, I feel like, are not really utilizing their summers properly. Like each summer, I would do three to five different things. You know, guys, like we're talking, I would do a Boy Scout trip. I'd be in the wilderness for a week, rowing 50 miles. Then I would go to a summer, I would do a study abroad in a foreign country. Then I would work in my parents' restaurant, right? Then I would like read some books and do some self-studying. Then I would do like another program at some college. And I did this every summer. So the more, the earlier you can do this and the more that you can do this, starting in ninth grade, 10th grade, it gets easier. It's kind of like a snowball. Because once you get into one program, um, when you apply to the next program, you basically have to submit a resume and you're like, look at these other programs that I've already gotten into. And your profile just keeps growing and growing and growing. And so each consequent program gets easier, right, to get into. Maybe the first program takes like 12 hours to apply. Then you just get better, more confident, easier. The next one, six, six hours. After that, four hours. After that, two hours. And you can recycle your old essays. So that is really important. Um, now, for a lot of juniors and seniors, if you're a junior, you really, really have to sit down, create a spreadsheet, and just tackle these opportunities one by one. Because there's a lot of programs that are just unavailable for ninth and 10th graders. Or at the very least, they prefer 11th graders. So sit down, apply to like, 10, 15, 20, um, no matter what. If you're a domestic American student or whether you're an international student, this is probably one of the best things that you can do to improve your profile um, for college admissions in the next six months, right? Especially good if you apply to programs at the schools that you want to go to. So if you want to go to Yale, then you apply for YYGS, Yale Young Global Scholars. If you want to go to Cornell, you apply for Cornell Summer College, Cornell Summer School. And then let's say you get in you don't have to go. I mean, sometimes these programs are kind of like cash cows and fake and they just charge a bunch. I heard YYGS is kind of like that these days. So what I recommend my students do is they apply, get in, boost their profile, and then they don't go. Just say, you know, you couldn't make it for some personal reason. Um, you really wanted to go, but that will still help your odds of when you apply to Yale early. And you're like, I applied to YYGS. I've been interested for like clearly 10 months. I just couldn't go. So all that helps. Um, a lot of students also ask like, oh, should I mention that like I went to the Yale program if I'm applying to Harvard, like will Harvard be jealous or mad? Uh, no, they're just going to say like, oh, clearly like the, the Harvard, uh, clearly Yale approved of them. So we should approve of them too. Like it can't really hurt you. It's pretty much only going to help you. Another thing to consider for summer programs is not to just chase the prestige or school, but to really focus on your academic interests and your, your basically you know, what makes you curious, that is even better. Like, for example, uh, Yale, hmm, what would be a good example? Like Yale's computer science summer program is not that good, right? If you were to do a really good one, it would probably be Stanford's or even Rice or UT Austin or Carnegie Mellon, right? Those summer programs are even better, more prestigious, higher quality. If you're interested in something really niche, like food, <laughs> food science, nutrition, agriculture, then I wouldn't apply to, um, I don't know, Stanford's. I'm sure Stanford has one too, but really the top programs would be like Yale and Cornell. Cornell has one of the best food science programs in the country. So those are other things to keep in mind. You can you might want to sort your list based on prestige, what schools you're interested in, or you can also sort it just based on what programs academically relate to your major, intended major, and what you're most interested in intellectually, if that makes any sense. Okay, let's take a look at some of the questions that people are putting in the chat as well. So some people, it looks like we have a ton of international students here, and people are thinking about applying to other kinds of schools in foreign countries. So the European universities is a completely different system. I'm honestly not that familiar with it, but I would recommend, um, I, would, I would just talk to people who've been through that process. I think it's very test-based. I think they have their A-level exams. Um, it, it, I don't think you actually have to write many essays, but anyways. 
Um, okay. So I'm from a bad school. We don't have any counselors. Um, so I would still find some trusted advisor or leader adults in your community to be able to write a letter of recommendation for you. It doesn't necessarily have to be a teacher from your school. Yeah, I know it's tough, guys. International students, acceptance rates and all that, it is not easy at all. Okay. Oh, a lot of people are talking about studying for the SAT or ACT as well. Definitely do that Yeah, around junior year. The earlier you can knock that out, the better. Some students knock it out in 10th grade. Amazing. But I would try to do it if you haven't done it yet and you're a junior, then I would try to do it now as opposed to when you're writing college applications as opposed to the fall. Definitely don't take standardized tests then. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. The earlier you can do it, the better. Okay, so we've covered summer programs, which can also count as national or international awards. If you are accepted to some really prestigious summer programs and you know they have a less than 10% acceptance rate, that counts, guys, as an award. Um, okay, other things that you can do to really boost your chances is performing, we also briefly mentioned this, but a menial job. A menial job really just instantly communicates humility. You wouldn't believe it, but literally there's some rich parents who kind of like, I wouldn't say pay, but they purposefully push their kid to do a, a menial job, such as wait, waiting tables or lifeguarding at a pool or beach or working as a janitor uh, or cooking, something very menial to show that, hey, we're not just like some rich, you know, spoiled kid, but we actually do, uh, we, we showcase humility. So these right, menial job is really powerful. I myself wrote my own essay about working in my parents' Chinese restaurant, which like I said, it also makes for really amazing stories. I had another student who was a manager uh, or a branch manager, assistant manager at, at McDonald's, and he wrote his essay about that. And the first time he applied to college, he didn't do a very good job. Um, he wrote more about politics. And then the second time he wrote about this opportunity and basically got in everywhere, which was crazy. So this menial job, you don't also have to work a menial job for years. You could just work at a menial job, Chipotle rolling burritos, um, Doing something like that for four weeks, six weeks is enough. Um, maybe longer is a little bit better, so it doesn't look as what is it called, flaky or fake. But yeah, I would do I would do it for at least six weeks. But you don't need to do it for months or years. But a menial job instantly communicates humility. That is a big deal. And then these days, guys, if you don't have this sort of like service project or passion project, right, or initiative it is going to hurt you a lot. These days, like everyone and their second cousin has their own little nonprofit or at the very least has written like a short children's book or has something of that sort. And if you don't have that, it is going to be a big knock, especially for East Asian applicants. So like Chinese um, or Japanese, uh, but mainly like Chinese Americans. It really, like you do need this element of leadership. I'd say a lot of South Asian Indians, Indian Americans um, are much better at this than Chinese folks for some reason. Uh, back in the day, like, you know, we would just emphasize music, math, <laughs> but now I think a lot of Chinese parents are realizing this is not enough. And so they're encouraging more community action, service, that sort of thing. I will be doing the reading college essay series again, I promise. My goal this year is to make 100 YouTube videos, so that's pretty exciting. I can show you guys a sneak peek of a new video that I was creating, this how to get into Yale video. I've moved into a new uh, two-bedroom apartment, and we've created, we've made one of the bedrooms into a, uh, we've made one of the bedrooms into a YouTube studio. For some reason, I can't find it right now. I was just, yeah, I hired this editor to help me. Yes. Okay. I'll show you guys a sneak peek of this new video. It's a, I, I'm doing like these little whiteboards um, where, or a giant post-it. I'm so glad this turned out well, but I'll be doing a series where I'll explain how to get into every top college, Yale, Harvard, MIT. And like, you know, my frustration is that so many of these um, YouTube videos are like, the advice is so generic. Like you need leadership. Really? No idea. <laughs> of course you need leadership. You need volunteering what? So I kind of break down like what exact kinds of leadership particular schools are looking for. Yale in particular likes very cookie cutter traditional style leadership. 
So if you have a big model UN club and you've risen through the ranks, they love that. If, um, but you know, MIT on the other hand loves quirkiness. They love self-invention. They love product development, things like that. So I've been, yeah, really excited for this new video series. I'm really working hard on YouTube this year. I think it turned out really well last year. So thank you guys for watching. Like I genuinely would not make videos if I was just posting into the void. You know what I mean? I create these videos particularly because I want to help students who maybe don't have the requisite resources, students, international students, uh, first gen low income students. Those are the kinds of people that I want to reach. I mean, sure, we help wealthy kids each year, but we're really trying with, especially with YouTube, just trying to reach the, the right folks who want, who are searching for these resources. I mean, I used to make TikToks too, but TikTok was just oh, toxic because these kids, they're, they're not searching for this information. It's just appearing on their feed and they're like, help me now, fast, quick, acceptance, admit, yesterday. I'm like, guys, you got, you got to put in some work. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. But anyways, um, I'm really excited for this new series. I'll be doing YouTube lives, really trying to commit and still do YouTube lives every two weeks. Um, and oh yeah, there's another thing that I wanted to show you guys, but we created this new Discord channel for Elevates Ed. And um, I'm just trying to, yeah, I'll invite you guys now in the chat. Definitely join, definitely join. We are trying, yeah, here in this channel, um, you guys can ask me questions and I'll try to respond to them at least within 48 hours, 72 hours. And the idea is that there were a lot of students who use our services, have gotten into college. They're now seniors. They're about to leave, graduate. But I still wanted to help you guys out because going to college, transitioning to college is really difficult. And so there's a lot of things that no one else on YouTube or really the internet is talking about, like how to make money between that summer, between senior year, your first year of college, how to apply for clubs. A lot of that was a huge shock for me and a lot of my students to or our students, I should say, who got in. But anyways, join the Discord. We're really excited for, I just I just want to keep helping you guys and keep giving you guys value because it makes me sad that kids get in, they unsubscribe, and then they just abandon us forever. That makes me a little sad. So I'm just trying to figure out how to continue to help you guys. And then a lot of our students who get in, they end up potentially even working for the company, um, helping us create you videos or edit essays, teach, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so wonderful. Uh, definitely join and I look forward to, um, yeah, hey, there you go. Hi, Spedro. Um, but yeah, then you can join the appropriate channel where you are, uh, yeah, where you need to be. And I think we'll make like the first 50 people who join free. And then after that, we'll charge a small fee, maybe like two or three dollars a month. Okay. So let's go back to some of the other points. Really, the th just to reiterate, the three best things you can do summer program, absolute king, right? Boom. Then menial job, also, you know, one of the best three things you can do. I'll just say key, key one, key two. It's just important. Okay. So some program is important. Menial job, important. Service project, also really, really important. And honestly, guys, I feel like not enough people are just putting energy into their essays. There is a big, big monumental difference between, I can tell if this is your second draft or if it's your eighth draft. I can tell. And the essays can play up to like 30, maybe even 40% odds of you getting in. You can write your way in. Absolutely. I mean, depending on how good your story is, you can write your way in. So even if you don't have A's, even if you have just B's or C's, like you can write your way into a, to a top 20 school. Okay. So some question, Yaroslava Rukman, can I be accepted to a top university after two gap years? Yeah, there's some, there's some programs actually where let's say you have started delayed for some reason. This is really popular for students who are like, had to, uh, join some military service, but like there's schools with special programs um, specifically designed for non-traditional students who came through because of so so something along these lines. But you just have to look for these schools, top schools, they have these special programs and you might have a better odds applying for this as opposed to just traditional, you know, going through. So this is like, typically they take a lot of students who are like military um, backgrounds, but any any kinds of non-traditional students. So I would look into that. Your best bet might also just to be go to a normal school or community college or local university in your country. Absolutely ball out, guys. Like go like work twice as hard as you imagined. Create like a set of goals for awards you want to win, research you want to do, then transfer. That will also be better than just I didn't go to school for two years or three years. That could look a bit more suspicious. 
Um, yeah, definitely choosing a major is going to help. And especially choosing a more niche major will help as well. I'm glad we started talking about this. You know, okay, like, I don't have to spell this out, but maybe I do. Like, Asian male interested in applying for CS, math, music, is going to be tough. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That's why, uh, you know, some of my students, they were even thinking about switching things up. So they did something like computational chemistry. Yes, good. This will improve your odds, right? So really strategizing what major unpopular majors. I had an Indian girl interested in linguistics, computational linguistics. Already, you know, instead of saying you want to be a doctor, that's going to help your odds. And then after you get in, change your major to whatever you want. But in order to pull this off, you, your activities have to actually revolve around, you know, the major that you say you want to study. So if you say, I want to study computational linguistics, you've never taken any linguistics courses, you have nothing related to linguistics. Yeah, of course, that's going to look hella suspicious, right? But if you're able to craft a profile that's more centered around, um, I don't want to say something less popular, but something that's something that's not as, I, I guess I, I guess it is less popular. I myself, right? I knew that applying as, um, actually, I didn't really have much of a choice. I didn't strategize, guys. I just looked at my activities and I was like, okay, I have all these random activities. I'm a Boy Scout. I do student council. I know languages. What can I say here? What's my story? And so I just spun it and said, I'm interested in being a diplomat and studying international relations. And it worked. So Yale, Princeton, they have really famous international relations programs. And they're like, actually, Kevin's done some study abroad. He knows like four or five languages. This is pretty convincing. And so I got in and my Yale admissions officer actually added a handwritten note at the back of my letter and said, hey, I think you'd really thrive in our Jackson you know, Jackson Institute Global Affairs Program. Like that's how they think, right? When they see your profile, guys, they're thinking about how do you um, fit into the college? Yo, what's up, Dowlet? Dowlet was a student, international student we worked with this past year. Um, I won't expose you, but I'll just say that he got into a really, really amazing good school. If you want to share some compliments, go for it, Dowlet. Um, but yeah, I'm going to answer some of these questions in just a second, but let me finish up my thought with what I was saying. So these... One of the most important things that I can emphasize in this video, guys, I need, yeah, this is so important. I'm going to add a heading. Um, no, that's that's a little excessive. But let's put this here. Colleges are not interested in – colleges are not – not – this is so important. This is literally the most important thing of this entire video. Colleges are not not interested in diverse students. They are interested in diverse classes. What does this mean? The moment that you guys apply, they're going to be thinking about, okay, so, oh, I get it. This is an astronomy kid, or I get it. This is an international, this is a, you know, diplomatic kid. Um, they, they're a private school kid. Okay, how many private school international relations kids do we have? Oh, not that many. Cool. Let's take him. Or they'll be like, oh, this is you know, yet another Asian male interested in CS and math from the Southeast. Damn, we already have too many of those. So that's literally how they think. That's how they think. And they want, they're, create, they're interested in creating these diverse classes. They don't want to see that you are like, okay, it depends on the school. I will say that. But they don't want to see that you do this and this and this and this and this, like five or six different things. I will say there are some exceptions to that rule. Yale is really interested in Yale and. These days, a lot of schools like Harvard and Yale, they like seeing that you're really good at one STEM and one humanities. And you're able to bridge that. That's why like something like computational linguistics is really powerful. But um there should be some degree of specialization, um, but at the same time, it's, it's a fine balance. I hope that kind of makes sense. I can clarify on this later if you guys still don't understand. Okay, so um, damn lax. Sorry, I joined late, but could you repeat something about extracurriculars? I don't have any for the Ivy League. So to get to Ivy League level extracurriculars, you're going to need, as an international student, you are going to need some form of a national award, especially considering that some of your guys' nations are just, you know, um, stating this kind of factually, are about the size of some American states, right? Like California, huge state. Several maybe small European countries um, are not bigger than California. So if you have a national award, for, for us, that's kind of like a state award, right, as a domestic student. So keep that in mind. To really be competitive, you need national, even better international awards. If you have done summer programs with U.S. Un universities, that also helps your case a lot. How would you recommend sharing unique learnings and insights from our experiences in the college essays? 
Um, I think that's a pretty complex question. It's going to depend on the particular story. It's going to depend on what insights you're, you want to share. So it's very case by case. Probably the best thing you can do is watch the series where I was editing students' essays last year. And I'll be doing that again uh, in October once people send us their essays to review. Mayisha, hello. <laughs> I really need your POV to this. I'm an international applicant from South Asia. Um, I had excellent academic program until grade 10, and I was among the top half a percent. But then um, my mom was the only financial provider. She had libero pneumonia, hospitalized, my grades deflated. So you can mention all this in your additional information section. Um, and if you had to take care of someone, that's totally fine. I think they will understand quite a bit. Wow. Yeah. Gold medal on Olympiads nationally. I think you have a really good shot at many top 20 schools. So if you're interested, if you're an Indian girl interested in computer science, you are going to need some other dimension. You know, you can't just be like, I am interested in CS, NLP, ML. Not enough. I would combine it with some other humanities, right? Like you're really interested in using CS as a tool to empower others using education, educational apps, or you're interested in using CS to teach language, or you're interested in using CS to promote peace and fight injustice. That is a much better avenue. Do you guys see the difference? You can't just be like, yeah, I learned Java, right? Nowadays, there's like smart middle schoolers who could say that. Okay. Um, the invitation to the Discord again. Uh, how do, I'm actually not even that, um, well, let me find it again. How do I invite people? I feel like such a boomer. Oh my God. Um, let me find the Discord invite in just a second. I think it's this. Oh, okay, yeah. Join the Discord, guys. We'll be posting. Uh, and what's really cool is we have some students who have worked, who, who we mentored and you know uh, helped them get into college. And now they're going to be giving advice on the Discord too, which is pretty neat, if I may say so myself. That's the whole purpose of this company, guys. We're just trying to elevate you guys, not just through from like, oh, junior year to senior year, senior year to, to college, but <laughs> boy, boy, oh boy. Once you graduate from college, do things get serious? And we would just want to keep giving you guys resources, tools to help you succeed. This college is one thing. Uh, the real world is another. Okay. So that's the invitation to the Discord. And I think we're pretty much coming to the end of our talk. I hope you guys found this useful. One other thing that I wanted to know from you guys is what content do you want to... Um, what content do you want me to make? What topics do you want us to cover? What information would be most helpful for you to know? I'm kind of getting a sense based on the questions that you guys are asking, but please give me more ideas so that I can be more and more useful and helpful to you. I don't want to make videos and like I post them and nobody watches them. Super duper sad. As a YouTuber, it's happened to me so many times. But please tell me what videos, content, information you want me to know. Also, let me know if you guys are a junior, are you a senior? What's your deal? Are you a college freshman? That gives me a better sense of what kind of material to make for you guys as well. For more international students, tons and tons of international students. Okay. There's a really great channel called Crazy Medusa. She specializes in international students. I wouldn't say that we help international students very much. I mean, we do. Um, but there's so many of you guys, to be honest, that we can only take a handful, which is tough but I will try to make more videos related to, to that. This, but this channel is really, really great. Then there's some people like College Essay Guy, who's also wonderful. He really helps with essays, but he explicitly says on his channel, we don't help international students at all. So in international students, it is a bit of a challenge for sure. But <clears throat> I know a lot of you guys are interested in applying to American universities. However, the reality is, just keep in mind that they're really only going to be taking maybe like five, less than less than five or 10 people from your country. You know, they take less than 10 students from China every year. China, the biggest country in the world with a billion people, less than 10. And, you know, think about it. Half of them are going to be athletic recruits. 30% will be athletic recruits. Another 30% will be from top rich international um, private schools. So in order for you guys to really start standing out, I think you'll, you'll start, you should really start thinking about building out national awards, um, summer programs. And at the very least, like let's say you guys don't get into Yale the first time around, keep applying. And no one really cares that much about the undergrad, but if you guys can get a master's degree there or a PhD, that's even more important and impressive. So just keep trying guys. And as long, it's, it's really not just about like, oh, the acceptance, but truly the journey and the kind of person that you become throughout that process.
you're still going to become like, I mean, many of you already are some of the top students in your country. And if you just keep striving and aiming, you'll be in really good shape. Oh, thank you guys. Your videos are nice. More videos for international students. Um, I will be doing this for sure. I'll be making, I'll bring in others from the team as well so that you guys can see. Some of them are much better at editing than I am. I'll be completely honest. Um, and they are actually much older than, well, not much, but they're older than me. They have a lot more wisdom. They review, like one of the guys we brought on, John Paul, he's from Alaska. He went to Stanford and now he's doing his master's degree in China. And he reviews applications for people who are applying for these master's degree programs. His editing is much better than mine. I don't know how many of you guys used our editing services last year, but they were fire. Like I can confidently tell you they're the best in the world. Yeah, we charge a little bit more, but they're really, really good. And we also offer scholarship edits as well. Bring Alec and Vanilla. Okay, I'll bring them in. I'll bring them in. I'll be doing some YouTube lives where I'll just invite people to come talk as well. Jeff will be coming. Vanilla. I'll bring in different folks on the team so you can see it's not just Kevin. You know, I really don't do this alone. Maybe three years ago, it was just me. But the company has grown to a point where it's impossible for just one person to manage, which is a good thing. It's really exciting, honestly. So please keep asking me questions, engaging with our content, just liking, sharing, telling other folks about the channel if you're feeling grateful. That's the best way that you can help us. And um, again, I really wouldn't be making these videos if you guys weren't here watching, asking questions. And I'm just uh, super thankful that you guys are all here. We're really trying to reach more folks from around the world. So Alessandro was asking about Latin American students. Same deal. You're going to want national awards from your country, expressing interest in these colleges, applying to the programs, building out your um, building out your initiatives, things like that. We don't see your vids for editing, but how a person you're motivating. Thank you. Thank you. That's really sweet. I'm doing my best. And um, yeah, really excited to to grow the channel and eventually not just cover college consulting material, but some other things too, like how to learning how to learn or surviving your first year of college once you get there, what you should be thinking about. Uh, more entrepreneurial things, more ideas about how we ran, how we run this educational business. Um, I won't go into the exact numbers, but now Elevate Ted is close to like a seven-figure educational company, which is pretty mind-blowing. Um, but yeah, our goal is really to help as many kids as possible rather than helping. I think a lot of like college consulting companies, they help like a few kids. And I don't know if you've heard, they charge like fifty to $60,000 a year helping these kids starting in eighth, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. Then they just charge them through the roof. And we debated doing that. I'll be, I'll be real. I'll be honest. We considered it. And then I was like, that's, that's not really who I want to become. That's not why I went to Exeter or Yale, you know, to help elite people become more elite. Like, I really feel like it's our mission and vision to cast a wider net and just uplift everyone. So the people who are watching here, like, you're in the right place. You're the kind of people that I want to help. You're the people who are searching out this content, who are serious about improving your own education and actually want to grow as a human being. There's a lot of students who have the same access to these resources, and they're not here. So that says a lot about you guys. And um, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I can't wait to see you guys again in two weeks. All right? Take it easy, folks. See you later.